Thank you very much, Idil, for those kind words. And I'd really like to thank everyone who's involved in the Protect Consortium for the invitation to be here this week, but also for the cooperation that we have enjoyed with UNHCR throughout the project. It's been particularly valuable for us to learn of some of the outputs of the work over these last few days, which clearly have some very important potential to further some of the debates and to serve as tools to promote higher standards in the application of refugee law, asylum and migration policies, including reinforcing respect for the rights of migrants. I've been asked today to speak about expectations for this year's Global Refugee Forum, which will be held in Geneva in December. And I want to connect it to some of the opportunities I see emerging from the work that's been done in this project and particularly to focus on the topic of our meeting, safeguarding international protection. But first, perhaps just to recap some of the key features of the Global Compact and the GRF. The Global Compact, of course, was affirmed by the General Assembly of the UN in 2018, and it aims to build on the binding international legal framework for refugees, including the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, but also customary international law, and very importantly, regional refugee instruments, including in Africa and Latin America. While not legally binding in and of itself, the Global Compact seeks to promote and ensure greater observance of those existing standards in practice in a climate in which we see clearly also borne out from some of our discussions over these few days, a significant need for that. It seeks also to provide a framework for more predictable and equitable responsibility sharing and solutions for refugees. Responsibility sharing being a concept that's not regulated in international law, but which has important foundations therein. And I'll return to that shortly. At the same time as the GCR was adopted, the UN General Assembly also endorsed the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, which of course is aimed at strengthening protection for the rights of migrants and furthering cooperation on migration management and governance for the first time in such a comprehensive international instrument. The GCR established the Global Refugee Forum, which seeks to provide a high-level platform which will be convened every four years to bring together states but also many other stakeholders where they are encouraged to make and fulfil pledges linked to the GCR's objectives, and thereby also promote more coordinated and comprehensive international responses to refugee situations. Of the over 1,400 pledges that were made in and since 2019, almost 25% have been fulfilled, while many others are, have substantially advanced in their progress. And this December, the second GRF, will be one where we'll be taking stock of what progress has been made but also seeking to encourage states and other stakeholders to further advance that implementation of the pledges and to look at making new and concrete commitments to address the many new areas of need in refugee protection. Multi-stakeholder engagement is a key feature of the GCR, and which calls for action not only by states, but also contributions from others who, based on their mandates or capacity, have contributions to make including all international organisations, civil society, private sector actors, host communities and refugees themselves. And this multi-stakeholder approach seeks to strengthen international uh, protection by bringing the different perspectives on these issues, as well as the expertise and capacity that we see in many refugee situations worldwide. In 2019, a very significant number of pledges were made by non-state actors, demonstrating the breadth uh, of these actors and their engagement in international protection in many important ways. Crucially, it also gave a platform and a voice for many refugees and refugee-led organisations, many of which have continued to develop their activities and increase their visibility in this work, as well as their role in advising and uh, highlighting to UNHCR key ways in which we can and need to improve our work. Since yesterday morning, oh, I should say, this multi-stakeholder approach, however, is not intended to let states off the hook, to permit them to evade their obligations or to transfer that somehow to other non-state actors. But it does seek to recognise and to give greater amplification to the important role that non-state actors can and do play 
in international protection in practice in many situations. Since yesterday morning, we've heard about some fascinating and in many cases very sobering findings emerging from the PROTECT work packages and many of the challenges to international protection in practice that they highlight. So this, I guess, raises a big question for the Global Compact on Refugees. What then can be done to strengthen international protection through a non-binding piece of paper drafted in challenging circumstances four years ago? I want to offer what might be a provocative answer to that, saying that this will depend to a certain extent on us in this room. I want to lay down the challenge to all of us, as well as our wider network, academics, lawyers, civil society organisations, members of receiving communities, refugees and international organisations, to advocate and to make pledges ourselves, to lend momentum to the process and to seek to press states to do what needs to be done to ensure international protection is safeguarded and reinforced, but also to make a difference to the lives of individuals where we can. Of course, speaking realistically, we see that today's environment is in some ways even more difficult than 2018. Here in Europe, we've seen the rise of the far right in a number of countries where they've consolidated their leadership and where they have moved into key roles in government in a number of states. The Syrian war in two weeks' time will mark its 12th anniversary. It's been going for longer than World War II. And we see millions of Syrian refugees who are unable to find solutions but are also finding the protection that they're enjoying in neighboring countries increasingly becoming precarious. In Afghanistan, the Taliban, of course, two years ago took over, and we've since seen human rights violations becoming routine, widespread, and systematic in many areas, particularly as regards the rights of women, forcing more to flee. And we have Rohingyas who remain displaced in their millions, including in Bangladesh, but increasingly also taking to the sea in dangerous maritime movements in search of safety. The conflict broke out in Ukraine, of course, but before that, we've seen it spread and uh, grow in the Sahel, in Central African Republic, Cameroon, Niger, uh, the Niger Delta, Ethiopia, and elsewhere. So these developments really highlight very starkly the need for those of us with relevant research, knowledge, and voices and influence in national, regional and international fora to use them to see if we can push for more commitments to reinforce refugee protection. This project was specifically funded by the Horizon 2020 program with the aim of seeking to ensure support for the implementation of the Global Compact. Now that the work's been done, fascinating and far reaching work as we've heard the last few days, we need to think about how we can use that in order to press for uh, some of the gaps in international protection to be addressed. I want to set out five key GCR areas where we've seen some progress, but where there is scope and a need to press for more in 2023, and encourage you to think about ways in which the PROTECT work and other work in which you may be involved can seek to further these aims. So firstly, responsibility sharing. The GCR calls for greater responsibility sharing, including amongst states, to seek to better protect and assist refugees, but also to support host countries and communities. And this is particularly critical in view of the stark imbalances we see in the global distribution of refugee populations worldwide. In 2021, 85% of the world's refugees were living in low and middle income countries. With displacement from Ukraine, that's shifted somewhat but it's still 74% of global refugees worldwide who are hosted in countries with far fewer resources to care for them than those we have in Europe. Despite the challenges that we all see and hear about regularly regarding Euro, uh, the EU's response to Ukraine, we therefore have many countries that are under extreme pressure who need greater support to be able to continue to provide support to refugees. A point on language. Natasha from the Commission noted yesterday that Gillian Triggs, like the GCR, referred to burden sharing, which is a term that uh, is used in the GCR alongside responsibility sharing. And UNHCR uses this not in order to emphasise that refugees are a burden on those countries and communities which host them, 
but rather to recognise that there are costs and there are challenges around hosting refugees that need to be more equitably shared and distributed. We think it also recognises the importance of those of us working in this field to acknowledge and seek to alleviate the, refuge, the burdens that refugees themselves carry, including in many cases the harm they've suffered, the trauma, their memories, and uh, to see if we can seek to find constructive ways to help them move uh, beyond that and also to make the most of the potential and the enormous contributions they can make to communities that host them. So burden and responsibility sharing encompasses solidarity at the human level, but also crucially underscores the importance of cooperation amongst states. And this needs to make sure that we can seek to strengthen international protection by ensuring that refugees receive adequate support and that states with limited resources are not left alone to cope with the challenges of hosting refugees. They should be able, under the GCR framework, to benefit from matching opportunities between donors and host countries, matching needs with available resources and pledges, as well as through direct financing, material and technical support and assistance, but also, crucially, more opportunities for refugees physically to be hosted in the Global North. So amongst some of the pledges and actions on responsibility sharing that we've seen over the past four years, there's been the establishment of some specific platforms designed to address specific refugee situations, including the MERPS program in Latin America, including to respond to large-scale Venezuelan displacement, the Solutions Strategy for Afghan Refugees, and an initiative led by IGAD in the Horn of Africa, based on the Nairobi Declaration and its accompanying plan of action, which seeks to establish a comprehensive regional approach to find and deliver durable solutions for Somalia refugees. The European Union and individual member states have provided significant financial support for these arrangements. But it's noteworthy that while supporting solutions in regions of origin for Afghan and Somali refugees, we continue to see very significant gaps in the provision of protection to refugees from these countries in many European states. Vastly different recognition rates for these two groups in, in EU countries along the lines that we heard this morning. Failure to apply UNHCR's clear country guidance highlighting the protection needs that the vast majority of the populations face in these two countries. And it's clearly a great deal more can be done to reinforce access to solutions in Europe for refugees from these contexts, to quick and positive asylum determinations and resettlement or complementary pathways for those who remain in their regions of origin and can't find solutions or safety there. As a second key area, addressing the immediate needs of refugees and supporting host communities to continue to do so. The GRF called for host countries to include refugees in national systems and services, moving away from the more traditional approach of putting resources into parallel systems operated by humanitarian agencies for refugees in isolation. And so reflecting this, we've seen countries like Jordan, Lebanon and Iran admitting refugee children to schools where they learn alongside local students in many cases, adding to strain on those local services. So those countries clearly need support to be able to provide education and other facilities. And this is also crucial to shore up the readiness on the part of host communities to continue to receive those refugees, recognizing that their presence brings benefits for the host communities that can uh, also assist them. Beyond education, we also seek to call for reinforced support for refugees and host communities. Healthcare, including for mental health and psychosocial support, an increasingly recognised area, as we've heard today, of uh, challenges for refugees. Jobs and livelihoods and services for people in situations of vulnerability, including children and people who've suffered or are at risk of gender-based violence. Again, Europe has contributed very significant financial resources to reinforcing access to these services and programs in many situations. But a great deal more is going to be needed to ensure that those countries are going to continue to be in a position to protect refugees in their regions of origin, in a climate in which we see negative economic trends, rising prices, and food insecurity amongst many other problems. But at the same time, responsibility sharing in, on the part of Europe needs to involve more than simply paying other states to host refugees physically in their territories. Listening to the discussion of some of the gaps in reception systems that we've heard about today, housing needs, 
mental health and psychosocial support, provision of basic services. Clearly, we need to be reminding European countries that the standards that they have enshrined in European Union law need to be respected. And if advocacy and calls for pledges is not going to succeed in advancing things, then litigation and other routes might need to be considered also. As a third key area, solutions. One of the central objectives of the Global Compact, which is particularly pressing given we see uh, in many, many situations that an end to displacement relain, remains elusive. The beginning of 2022, some 15.9 million refugees were in so-called protracted situations, which UNHCR defines as 25,000 or more people who've been displaced for five or more years. The average duration of displacement at present for refugees is 13 years, and we had 51 protracted situations in 31 countries last year. So if this doesn't highlight the urgent need to redouble efforts on solutions, then nothing will. So we've seen important pledges made in and since 2019 to try and increase access to solutions, including through creating conditions for people to voluntarily return in safety and dignity, including through development assistance, through humanitarian aid in many cases, but also to uh, seek to offer places for people to find solutions in third countries, including through resettlement. We had a number of countries that have pledged to increase their quotas, Canada, Finland, France, Iceland and Ireland, as well as Norway, amongst others. Community sponsorship programs have also been launched in the UK, Ireland, Germany and Spain and have been discussed in many others. Important and innovative programs which can allow private citizens and groups to be able to offer to receive refugees and to support their integration, welcoming them into their new host communities. And we've seen also a number of countries who have established or expanded complementary pathways legal avenues for refugees more easily to access family reunification, labour migration programs or study visa programs. This needs to continue, however, given the numbers of displacement, uh, the displaced people worldwide are rising exponentially. We need to have the resettlement provisions that are foreseen in the EU pact to be adopted to put these onto a more legally binding footing. But after that, there will need to be significant further advocacy to encourage the EU to do more on this front. There's two other key GCR areas where more progress is needed and where I think that the PROTECT program might have particularly relevant uh, insights that could be brought to bear in debate and discussion. Firstly, admission and access to territory. GCR has reaffirmed the importance of access to territory for those seeking protection, including respect for the principle of non refoulement which includes, of course, refraining from denying access to uh, refugees and asylum seekers at the frontier. But this is an area where we clearly have a need to see, refugee, to see Europe doing more. In recent months, we've had too many occasions where vessels which have rescued refugees and migrants in the Mediterranean have been unable to disembark in a place of safety in Europe, despite the fact that rescue has taken place in European search and rescue areas or affected by vessels flying EU member state flags, or accrued by NGOs who are based in EU member states. We could avoid some of the all too frequent tragedies that we are seeing in European waters if we were to see more firm pledges by coastal states to allow rescued refugees and migrants to disembark in line with international maritime laws obligations, and also more commitments to come from other non-coastal states to take some of those rescued for the purposes of processing asylum claims granting of protection where needed, or other forms of referral and support. A relocation initiative that was recently launched by the European Commission has seen too few places pledged, and where those have been made, they've been materialising too slowly. HCR and IOM have together been advocating for regional disembarkation mechanisms to reinforce capacity to disembark um, in states on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea as well as reinforcing protections capacity in neighbouring origins to obviate the lead for at least some people to take to the seas in these dangerous journeys. Concerted advocacy to support this could help us move towards breaking the deadlock on the issue and would represent a significant step forward, not only in regards to responsibility sharing, but also reinforcing access to international protection. But beyond this, we also need to see states refraining from pursuing problematic policies which seem to be specifically aimed at restricting access to territory and to safety for refugees. 
the instrumentalization proposal, which forms part of the package of the pact, which was critiqued by Catherine Muller from ACRA yesterday, in its current form before the EU legislature, has the potential to uh, enable states to very significantly derogate from their international protection obligations on broad, unclear, and arbitrary grounds. We also have seen a number of states either exploring, in the case of Denmark, or attempting to implement, in the UK's case, externalization policies, which aim to shift rather than share responsibilities for protecting refugees to other countries further afield, including in some that are manifestly not equipped or ready to provide protection in fair and efficient ways. And then finally, the operation of asylum systems needs to improve. We need them to work effectively and consistently to identify international protection needs. And this is really at the heart of some of the work that's been done by your research over the course of the past few years. We need to be able to amplify some of these findings and to bring them and call for states to account for the need to address some of the gaps they clearly highlight. Tomorrow, we're going to hear about a specific tool which can also make a significant contribution in this regard. The Practitioner's Handbook on the Common European Asylum System and the Compact, which specifically sets out ways in which states can and should interpret and apply EU law in ways that reflect the compact, and rather than seeking to uh, minimize standards and to uh, apply these in ways which uh, have some of the problematic results that we see. There's also scope to work uh, through another part of the GCR's responsibility sharing architecture, the Asylum Capacity Support Group, which has been set up specifically to mobilize commitments to support countries which have nascent asylum systems, which need technical support, advice, and financial assistance, but also could provide a forum to shine a light on some of the weaknesses in well-established asylum systems where we continue to see major gaps. There's an opportunity to call on states with systems that are not operating optimally, whether that's through too low recognition rates or failure to accord procedural safeguards, to make commitments to more investment in quality of asylum systems and outcomes, to ensuring procedural safeguards are respected, through more comprehensive training of officials, through the provision of legal advice and assistance, which at second instance level is an obligation under EU law, as well as reinforcing the skills and, available, and availability of interpreters and advisors who can provide access to information so that people who are in these systems are better equipped to be able to navigate their complexities and to tell the stories the way they need to. Again, information is a key obligation under the EU key, but it's one which is being honoured in the breach in too many instances. And let me talk then to the multi-stakeholder dimension. Because in addition to advocacy with states to commit to do more to address some of these really serious challenges, there's also a lot that can be done by others amongst us to further the GCR's aims directly, including responsibility sharing and efforts to facilitate access to solutions. I'll highlight two areas in this regard. Firstly, legal assistance. At the 2019 GRF, Members of the legal community, individual lawyers, law firms, and civil society organizations providing legal services collectively pledged to provide what, over the course of the next few months, grew to 127,000 hours of pro bono legal assistance to people seeking protection worldwide. This has been highly effective in providing essential legal services to refugees and countries uh, in all regions including through legal advice and representation, advice provided either in person or virtually, something new and innovative that we saw really taking off during the pandemic, but also support to refugee-led organisations to register, to be able to launch their activities, to fundraise and to do many other things. So in tracking fulfilment of that pledge, we've ascertained that it's actually 131,000 hours that have been provided, exceeding the commitments that were originally made. And there's a great deal of interest amongst the legal service providers to pledge again this year. And I'm encouraging all of you who may have dialogue with lawyers to consider taking part in all of this because the difference it is making for individuals is clearly enormous. The second area I'll highlight is tertiary education, dear to many of your hearts, I'm sure. It's worth recalling that only 3% of the world's refugee population is able to access tertiary education. And that compares to some 37% for the global total otherwise. And HCR has established an initiative known as 15 by 30, 
seeking to increase that percentage to 15% of the world's refugee population by the end of the decade. And academics can contribute directly to this initiative uh, if they wish to explore ways in which they can do so. Paragraph 43 of the GCR established the Global Academic Interdisciplinary Network, a network which aims to support research and teaching on refugee issues, but also scholarships for refugees. And since its creation, it's also developed a specific focus on supporting universities in the Global South, including in large host countries for refugees, as well as individual scholars in exile who may uh, not be able to get their qualifications recognised or may have very significant contributions they can make but are unable to do so because of lack of networks or inroads into the academic communities in their asylum countries. So both within and outside the global academic interdisciplinary network, we've seen many universities making commitments through the gain or otherwise. Some 48 substantive pledges were made in 2019 many of which have been fulfilled while others are advancing uh, rapidly. Those included pledges to facilitate access for refugees to tertiary education, including programs to support refugee students to access universities in their host countries, whether that involves raising funds to meet enrollment and tuition fees, books, charges, and other forms of support, but also facilitating access to places in universities in other regions, including support with application processes, documentation, fees, travel costs, and admission. We've seen a number of universities also signing up to become universities of sanctuary, providing bursaries or scholarships for scholars at risk in some cases, promoting the integration of refugee students through activities and through learning support, and assistance with language and social networks, amongst other things. We've also seen a number of universities develop or make available distance learning programs for refugee students who live in camps or in urban communities in refugee hosting countries who can't obtain the visas that they would need to travel for study. And this has made an incredible difference for the lives of a number of refugees who have succeeded with impressive results. And finally, let me mention another specific initiative that could be of interest. The Sergio Vieira de Mello Chairs were first developed in Brazil, where some 25 chairs exist in universities around the country. Um, and a number of other countries have since then also taken this idea up. It foresees a non-transactional partnership with HCR through a memorandum of understanding through which advice and support is given to develop a work plan potentially in one of three areas of work, research, teaching, and or out, ad, outreach and advocacy. So in addition to Brazil, Sergio Vieira de Mello chairs have now been established with universities in four countries, from the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, and the UK. And UNHCR is very interested to discuss with anybody who might be considering this possibility, the idea of whether this could be something that could be rolled out more broadly. My colleague, Anna Carol Pinto, down the back there, is specifically working on this initiative and would be delighted to talk to you about this further. And there's information, of course, on the web as well. Let me also mention an area which is not part of the GCR, but which is particularly relevant and important for our discussions here over these two days. Linking to the rights of migrants and the rights of refugees and migrants in mixed movements, where people who are moving for different kinds of reasons may be moving often in dangerous journeys alongside similar routes. Neither the GCR nor the GCM specifically deals with mixed movements, but the reality is we see these in regions across the globe and they create very significant challenges, for not only for states seeking to manage these, um, but also for individuals who are often exposed to enormous dangers and who may be exposed to some of the factors that cause the vulnerabilities we've talked about this morning. So what UNHCR is seeking to do this year is seeking to provide a platform where we can discuss the challenges around mixed movements and encourage states to seek to make pledges that could go directly to improving respect for the rights of refugees in those movements but also encouraging states to engage in the process around the GCM. We had the International Migration Review Forum for the first time in New York of last year, where a number of states made pledges to support the implementation of the Global Migration Compact, but there was a lot of confusion about this, sometimes mixing up refugee programs and uh, initiatives with those of migrants. And what we want to do is see if we can have a discussion in the margins of this year's Global Refugee Forum about ways in which states could be encouraged 
to put together pledges that would be twin pledges in the GCR process for refugees and in the GCM process for migrants. Because we need clearly greater initiatives on the part of many states that don't have in place adequate frameworks to protect the rights of migrants, to ensure they recognize the specificity of what needs to be done there, to ensure referral, to ensure provisions for access to uh, support and advice for migrants so that their human rights can be, be better respected in these complex movements. So in conclusion, the GCR and the GCM of themselves are not going to overcome all of the significant challenges confronting refugee protection or the protection of rights of migrants that we've identified over these few days. But they do provide us with concrete tools that we need to seek to use to the best we can for pressing states to make further commitments and to honour those in practice, but also to enable other partners to step up and play a role where they can. I want to encourage you to look at what pledges you or your institutions might be able to consider making, or to advocate or to seek to press more vocally, including with the incredibly rich evidence base that we've identified here, to encourage states to do what needs to be done. Where I as I have HCR to discuss this with you, I've got my contacts, which I'm ready to provide to anybody who's here. But we also have a dedicated team in Geneva that's looking at this and is particularly focusing on working with stakeholders who have objective and informed perspectives on how we can make this a really substantive outcome at the end of this year. So let me just say, you know, we heard from the commission yesterday that they saw themselves as firefighters who would like to be builders. And if I can make an analogy for that, I'd say that we at UNHCR are ambulance drivers who'd actually rather be unemployed. We would like to be unemployed because if all states honoured their obligations and were ready to welcome and to protect refugees effectively, there'd be no need for UNHCR anymore. We were originally supposed to have a three-year mandate because it was foreseen that by 1954 all of the world's refugee problems post-World War II would be resolved and there wouldn't be new ones emerging. Clearly that isn't the case, and clearly we all therefore need to be looking at ways in which all of us, not just HCR, this temporary organisation that was supposed to tackle a very specific situation, can bring together our share collective resources and abilities to bring about better frameworks for international protection. And I say we're ambulance drivers, not because we're trying to rescue a sick or injured international protection regime, but because there is a need to constantly focus on what's needed to save lives, which is what the international protection regime has done for millions of refugees over the years. But it's also because ambulance drivers don't get the job done just by themselves. It needs to be a much wider health system that can tend to the needs of people who need support. And in that same way, UNHCR needs to work with all of you in order to ensure that we can develop an outcome, deliver an outcome this year that is going to contribute to reinforcing and safeguarding international protection. 